everyone, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Kill Denby, and I am still your driver on this journey. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is, of course, the historic Game 6 of the ongoing World Championship match. Uh, as of today, Magnus leads with a, a three-game advantage after a couple bad blunders by Jan. But as of Game 6, the players were deadlocked in a tie. So this was the game that uh, seemingly started Jan's big downfall. It was the longest uh, chess game ever played in a World Championship match, at least by move count. Uh, and by time, it was pretty long as well, lasting, I, I think, about eight hours. Uh, at least that's how long the broadcasts were. So kind of a crazy long game. And it's obviously been covered a lot on uh, YouTube. But what I wanted to do is take a, a look at it through a slightly different lens. So um, I have personally been enjoying the commentary by Peter Svidler, Vlad Kramnik, and uh, Miro on a channel that I don't think too many people know about. So it's called Levitov Chess World, if you haven't heard of it. Uh, and like those commentators, I would recommend checking it out. Uh, and something I loved about their commentary is they brought up a bunch of games that the position was reminding them of. And so what I wanted to do is take a look at some historical games and see how knowledge of those games might influence the decisions of the players and how you can use knowledge of past games to influence your own decisions in your own games. Uh, but to start with, let's take a look at the opening in the game here. Magnus chose a slightly unusual move order uh, in the Catalan. So of course, normal would be to start with the pawn on c4, immediately challenging the center. Instead, uh, Magnus opts to just play knight f3 and g3. So committing to uh, fianchettoing this bishop, but not yet pressuring the pawn on d5. Now, the, the small little nuance here is there's a reason this isn't a popular move order. And one of those big reasons is it allows black to potentially develop this light squared bishop and get a quality just a little bit easier. Whereas if we play something like c4, Bishop f5 is going to be a lot harder to attain because we have this immediate pressure on the center. Uh, pressure that's normally relieved by c6 or e6. So that's why g3 is a little bit less common, but g3 is Magnus Carlsen's choice. And that's probably because he was hoping to get Nepo out of his direct preparation. Obviously, uh, Jan is going to be familiar with the opening in general and familiar with the positions arising. Uh, but perhaps he won't have the exact moves at, at least memorized. And to that effect, Magnus was somewhat successful. Uh, Jan plays e6 pretty quickly. Both players develop. We get castles, castles. And then uh, here, Magnus again has the opportunity to transpose to the main line with c4. But instead, he opts for this, uh, this little uh, nuance here with the move pawn to b3. And so with this, I think Jan was taken more or less out of his direct preparation. Obviously, he's going to be very familiar with the position, but uh, Magnus has, in a sense, succeeded in getting Jan to play, you know, th think by his own brain, as Komarov would say, rather than uh, the engine at home. Uh, we saw this move c5 come out pretty quickly. d takes c5 was Magnus's choice, and then this move c4. Uh, after a little bit of thought, Jan takes on c4, sort of demonstrating that this was the first move he was playing uh, entirely on his, on his own. Uh, Magnus has this nice little nuance of queen to c2 here. And I just want to mention that this move d takes c4 was getting a little bit of criticism from a lot of the commentary teams. Uh, and perhaps it's indicative of Jan's slightly less uh, experience in, in the position, slightly lesser experience. Um, he's at heart a Grunfeld player, and so positions like these he hasn't played quite as much in his career. Uh, and for example, it might make sense to develop the pieces a little bit, uh, a little bit more before opening up this diagonal, because capturing immediately does give White some tactical opportunities. For example, we see the move queen to c2, and rather than having to immediately recapture, uh, White is taking uh, advantage of the slightly loose bishop the lack of development from black to uh, take back the pawn a little bit more favorably. Black doesn't panic, though. Jan just plays queen to e7. And now we get this move, knight b to d2. So this, of course, is a pawn sacrifice. So what, what's going on here? Uh, well, Jan essentially could capture on b3. White would likely take back with the knight. We would see something like bishop to d6. 
And then white really does have a variety of, of options here. Uh, you can do any number of things. Maybe the, the retreat with knight f to d2 is something that Magnus had planned. It looks a little bit weird, but it really takes advantage of the fact that black is undeveloped on the queen's side. Basically, white just wants to activate this bishop as quickly as possible and make developing these queen side pieces a little bit more difficult for, for black. So perhaps seeing some of these lines, Jan wasn't thrilled with the idea of capturing on b3 and having to defend a position uh, with an extra pawn. Uh, psychologically, that can be pretty tough, right? You're just on the back foot right from the opening, and Jan didn't, didn't uh, see the need for that. Uh, so instead, Jan finds this nice idea of knight to c6, and after knight takes c4, um, I would be a little bit worried with the black pieces here, actually, if not for this nice resource that Jan had found. So let's say you just played a normal looking move like rook to d8. Uh, what do you guys think would be going on here? What would white be, be aiming to, to play? Why does black have a little bit of cause for concern? Uh, the diagonal or the? The di with the, the knight, the queen, and the, no, the other one. Oh, this way. OK. Um, yeah, that's not going to be, be the biggest problem here. Um, we'll actually see that this diagonal comes into play a little bit later. Uh, and it's definitely an important feature. But what I'm getting at is uh, if you give white too much time here, as we saw in the pawn sacrifice line, it's going to be really difficult for black to finish development. Um, like let's say something like knight to knight f to e5, for example, already opening up this bishop. And just, just to play some moves here, not saying these are the best, let's say black tries capturing and we capture back. Uh, all of a sudden, it's going to be really, really difficult to deal with all of this pressure to the queen side pawns. It's the quote unquote Catalan bishop, a uh, super strong bishop on the wide open diagonal that's going to apply a lot of pressure on, on black's queen side. So there is sort of a sense of urgency here for black, because if you don't finish your development now, you may not get a chance to. Or if you do, white's already going to be lined up on these open files before you have a chance to contest them. Right? You, you can't really take your time here. And you often have to, to sort of rush things in against the Catalan, because given enough time, white can organize the pieces to put a lot of pressure on those light squares. So that's why Jan went for this really interesting idea of b5. So this might be counterintuitive, right? We were just saying that black's problems lie on this long open diagonal. And seemingly, playing the pawn out to b5 only serves to help weaken these squares, right? Like now this knight has no defender. It's opposite this bishop. And the bishop also has access to the rook on a8. So what did Jan have in mind? Well, it's actually a very, very forcing line. Everything is, is coming with tempo. And he just calculated out that uh, white doesn't have a chance to make use of the weak diagonal uh, before black can actually contest it. So this is going to be a common idea for black to equalize in, uh, against the Catalan. Basically, black is saying that he can get his bishop out to b7 and contest this bishop on g2 with his own bishop uh, before anything bad happens. So. B5 uh, happens with tempo, so Magnus brings the knight out to E5. And then, again, another tempo move. Knight to B4 is crucial to black uh, getting full equality here. So knight to B4 hits this queen on C2. Magnus takes uh, advantage of this square he opened up on B2 with the move B3. And now we see this move bishop to B7. And here, Jan is saying, OK, I finished my development. Um, it didn't happen for free. This move pawn to b5 is maybe a little bit further than Jan would have liked to go with his b pawn. We can see that it weakened some squares. That's going to come up in a little bit. Uh, but more or less, Jan should have achieved uh, equality.
after bishop to b7. He negated this pressure on the long diagonal and is doing well so far. Uh, now we see this move a3 by Magnus. It's very, very sensible. He just wants to take back his b4 square. And here Jan chooses the move knight to c6 over something like knight to d5. I, I think knight to d5 is also pretty acceptable. Uh, and from here, after knight to c6, uh, Magnus plays a, a nice little move, knight to d3. And this move, in combination with Magnus's next move, uh, are going to lead me to my first historical game that, that I want to bring up. So knight, knight d3 to start with is keeping a knight on the board, keeping some pieces on the board, and we'll see why in just a moment. Bishop to b6, and then Magnus plays this move, bishop to g5. So let's try and understand why Magnus plays the move bishop to g5 and uh, what Magnus might have been thinking over the next few moves. So does anybody know what Magnus might be aiming for here? It's okay if you don't, because at the time when I was watching the game, I didn't, didn't fully understand either. So let's state the obvious first. So Magnus is pinning the knight to the queen, putting some pressure on this piece. And the question is why, you know, why do this? Um, and to give you one more move, Jan, for example, played rook f to d8 in response. Very simple, improving move. I'm willing to bet if you haven't seen the game or if you've forgotten, Magnus's next move might surprise you just a little bit. Any ideas? There's nothing earth shattering here, but just good chess moves. What comes to mind? What seems natural? Yeah. Okay, so this is, well, then you're, you're not surprised by Magnus's next move because Magnus actually does immediately capture on f6. Now, this move, I would actually say, is just a little bit unnatural. And the reason for that is, in general, when you have a piece sort of really pinned down, uh, it makes sense to leave it there, right? The, the piece isn't going to walk away. It can't move. It's pinned. And so it seems like the idea of bishop takes f6 isn't going anywhere. So why rush things by, by capturing the knight? That's why I would sort of characterize it as surprising. Um, other natural moves might just be bringing a rook to the center, something like this. And, and those seem totally fine and acceptable as, as well. Um, but what Magnus is going for is actually something pretty specific. So, so let's see what happens after we take on f6. So we take on f6. Jan actually does take back with uh, the pawn. And the reason for that is I think Jan wanted to go for some pretty quick simplifications. And we can see those happen after rook to c1 and knight to d4. And this actually wouldn't quite be possible if Jan had traded the queen. So for example, queen f6, if we take, take, and go down the exact same line, knight d4 actually has a, a tactical problem here. Um, and the problem is we can take, and now unlike in the game, uh, the bishop on b7 is actually hanging. There's no queen on e7 to defend it anymore, and so you cannot take on d4. You have to take on g2. And white has some nice ideas here, like knight takes e6. These inter intermediate moves uh, taking advantage of the placement of uh, black's rooks. Um, and for example, if you're not convinced by that line, let's, let's bring the other rook to c1, and then it's even more apparent because here you simply have to move the rook. There's no bishop takes f1 tricks. And uh, clearly, this simplification idea by Jan is, is not going to be working. So I think that's why Jan ended up taking with the pawn. Just again, more calculation. And then Magnus brings the rook to the c file. We get knight d4 takes, takes on d4. Again, this is possible because of the queen. Queen to a2. Slightly awkward move by Magnus, but he needed to keep this a3 pawn defended. 
uh, and then takes on g2, takes on g2. So the question is, what's going on in this position? Why was Magnus aiming for this? And I think it might be difficult to understand you know, why, would, why would Magnus want to aim for a position like this when it seems like black has a very active bishop and should be doing, doing fine objectively. And objectively, black is doing, doing fine. But to understand why Magnus went for this, I actually want to go to a game between uh, Zoltan Ribli and Anatoly Karpov from uh, a while back now. Uh, if you haven't heard of Ribli, I think he's uh, one of the very, very strong Hungarian players that have uh, been there kind of throughout history, always lurking in the top 10 somewhere. And of course, Anatoly Karpov is Anatoly Karpov. So what happened in this game? In this game, we see sort of a similar Catalan position. Uh, the difference here is that the knight has been traded for the dark squared bishop on f4, and it's actually white with the fractured pawns rather than black. And what happened quickly in this game is after c5, we saw these pieces come off the board. The queens also got traded here. We saw a couple more moves. And then after knight e5, takes, takes. And this uh, material balance should seem pretty familiar to our game. We have a knight versus the bishop and a couple rooks on the board. And I think it's because of positions like this and Magnus's experience in the Catalan, uh, I think this is why he chose to go down this path where he was sort of aiming for this balance of pieces. Because it turns out, Although objectively, black is doing OK in this position. I mean, the material's even. The pawns are almost symmetric. We have 4 versus 4 and 2 versus 2. Uh, despite all of this, it turns out that this knight is going to be really, really useful compared to the bishop. And indeed, in the game, we saw this knight get driven away. Um, white shores up the pawns. And then white was able to target these various weaknesses in the black camp. Now, in this case, it's the e6 pawn that's weak when that's not going to be the case in Magnus's game. But black does in indeed have weaknesses in that position as well. And despite the, the even-looking position here, uh, white very convincingly uh, improves his position, targets the weaknesses, and before too long is able to use this strong knight as a nice attacking piece along with the rook. And white wins this game pretty, pretty convincingly here. We see. 3 versus 2 on the king's side, the, the rook cleans up another pawn. And then without getting into too much detail, um, there's a lot of back and forth here. Not the most uh, well-played endgame in the world, but white does indeed win this, uh, this rook endgame in the end, with resignation happening um, not there, but here. Because if you move the rook, that's actually checkmate. Um, and so knowledge of games like this, where you have been exposed to these ideas before, um, you've seen that this balance of pieces tends to be good for white practically. The knight is going to be more useful than the bishop. It's going to have good squares, good outposts, and is going to give you a good end game to try and press a little bit. Having knowledge of games like this in the openings that you play is really going to help you in your decision making. Because Magnus is familiar with positions like this, maybe not necessarily even this exact game, but this idea, this end game, because of all of that, he's able to, to more confidently maneuver the game towards that material imbalance, keeping in mind that this knight's going to be useful to target all these weaknesses lurking in, in the black camp. And he's so confident in that material balance that he's even willing to allow black to get very, very active in this case. So uh, what Jan is essentially going for here is he is uh, saying, my pieces are so active in the center of the board that you know your, your positional understanding, your knowledge of this endgame, it's, it's not really going to make a difference here. You, you have to deal with my, my active, active pieces, and you're not going to be able to maneuver the game uh, to that better ending that you're hoping for. Uh, but I just want to highlight, you know, if you don't know these things about the position, Magnus's plan here kind of seems a little bit like strange. You know, it just seems like Magnus is randomly trying to trade pieces and, and get a draw, when I, I think that does sell it a little bit short. He's on purpose trading very specific pieces, aiming to leave black with this dark squared bishop against this strong knight on d3. Um, so does that make sense? Like, any questions about how we're, we're making that, that jump? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry if I missed this, but it was 
right? Yeah, it was also a Catalan okay. in, in the Ribley Karpov game. Um, I didn't show the full opening, but uh, it was a similar Catalan, where again, and rather than trading the bishop for the knight on f6, the trade happened with the knight capturing on, on f4. So, yeah, so if you're um, preparing to play the Catalan, just if, um, you, you would like those games like this, uh, high level. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that, that's the, the point to take away. You know, obviously, not everybody here is going to be a Catalan player. But by looking at historical games and famous games and the openings that you play, that's how you can start to build up your knowledge and feel a lot more confident in your decisions. You can more confidently trade off these pieces when you know that this should be a good endgame for white. This should be a comfortable endgame for white. If you've never seen that game and never seen that idea, it's going to be really, really tough um, to just sort of decide that uh, on the spot at the chessboard that you think this is a good endgame. You know, it's... It's not very clear at the moment that this knight should be better than this bishop. But because we've seen these games happen before, we know how, how it works out practically. Uh, Magnus is able to make those decisions. And I really highlight that in this case because I think that's where Jan has been lacking in this world championship. He's sort of changed his style to fit the world championship. He's no longer the Grunfeld attacking Jan Nepomneshi that we know. Instead, he's sort of adopting the Fabiano Caruana style of play, where he's super solid, tries to play all the best moves. And the, the downside of that is he doesn't quite have as much experience as a player like Magnus Carlsen in these positions. Of course, he's miles, miles better than anybody in this room, but that, that's my take on it. Uh, but in the game, we still have a lot of chess left to cover. We're only on move 20 of like 100, and billion, 100 billion moves in this game. Uh, we get queen e4, activating the queen. Uh, Magnus brings the queen back to life from its little hole on a2. We see this move a5. It's a pretty nice move by, by Jan. It's a good improving move. Threatening things like a4, things like b4 to uh, force white to give up control of some squares on the queen side. We see the move rook f to d1. And then a slightly uh, timid move, king g7 by black. And then here... Oh, I, yeah, right. sorry, go ahead. What was his idea of moving the king? What was the thought behind that? Um, so it's actually a move that Jan played very, very quickly in just a minute and a half. Um, and it's just a, a typical improving move, right? Uh, by bringing the king to g7, you get the king off of the eighth rank where it might get checked. You help to defend your weakness on f6. And uh, it, it supposedly is going to improve the king's position. In this case, I, I do think it's actually a little bit of a mistake because it doesn't improve your position that much. And indeed, you might actually be stepping into potential checks a little bit later on. So I'm not in love with the move king g7. I think it was maybe a little bit rushed by Jan in this case. Uh, but that's the idea. Uh, the king should, in theory, stand better on g7 than on g8. It just helps defend your weak squares. Uh, because the g7 pawn is, is missing. Uh, but yeah, that being said, I'm not, not in love with this move. Uh, I'm also not in love with Magnus Carlsen's response. So he played this move rook to d2. Uh, now, does anybody remember or know what white is, is trying to go for here? If you've seen the game, uh, you, you might have some idea of what Magnus had in mind. But how is Magnus dealing with these super strong centrally placed pieces. How is he trying to deal with them? Because it's great to talk about having the, the theoretically better end game, but if your opponent has super active pieces, you're going to be in for a little bit of trouble. It looks like he's doing everything he can to not push his pawns. I think the commentators are really shocked that uh, E3 wasn't played. Right. So E3 is essentially the, the idea. And I think it's the best move in this case. Mm -hmm. Um, and that has to eventually be your idea to deal with the pressure of this bishop against the king side and, and move it to a slightly worse square. Um, so what Magnus did in the game rook d2 is a slower version of actually the same plan. I think his idea was, was the same. 
Um, but I think e3 immediately was, was definitely called for. So let's say rook d2. And I mean, let's, let's say black passes here, something like h6, you know, just, just to put a move on the board. Um, I think what Magnus might have been intending is to go queen to d1 and follow this with the move e3. So allowing this queen to have access to the king's side to attack some of those weak squares um, with the idea of an eventual e3. However, I think this idea was a little bit too slow. I think instead, like you were saying, that the commentators thought this as well, the immediate e3 was, was definitely the way to go. Just for example, the bishop moves out of the way. We can bring the queen to e2. And black actually has to walk a, a pretty thin line here to maintain equality. Uh, I think what black needs to do is actually play this move h5, uh, trying to create some threats uh, of checkmate or just at least opening up the white king. White might play h4 in response. And then black has a few moves, but keeping uh, an eye on these pawns is a good idea. Something like knight c5, and we might see some simplifications here. Um, although, again, an endgame like this is exactly what Magnus Carlsen kind of had in mind. You know, you, you get to this knight and rook endgame against bishop and rook, and already there are very concrete problems, like knight to b7, that Jan would have had to deal with just in this example line. Black should still be fine, but practically, I think this is what Magnus wanted. He wanted an endgame like this, where you can play for a long, long time, try and uh, provoke some, uh, some mistakes from Jan, and sneak his way to a victory. Now, we don't actually see that happen in the game, but I think e3 immediately was definitely called for by Magnus. And yeah, what's up, Ryan? Uh, oh, never mind. I, I was about to say, was he thinking about one of the rooks to c8, and then in that case, you would want to um, cut the queen behind the rook? Um, well, it's, it's interesting that you say that, because rook a to c8 was oh. played in the game. Um, but, uh, but going to e2 also would have been yeah, yeah. And, and we'll see that Magnus had no intention of moving the queen out of the way uh, against rook a oh, to c8. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, of course, uh, after e3, uh, I'm not entirely sure what's going on after rook a to c8. Um, this involves more calculation than I might be able to do. But I think maybe knight c5 is working. Uh, take, take, and you have some problems, right? Uh, take here, I guess, and then, no, if you take there, then I can take back. So bishop takes, 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 takes. Although maybe this end game is, is going to be a draw. So, all right, L let me ask the, the engine overlords here what's going on. Okay, again, you just take on c8, and you get to, uh, to positions we are more familiar with, as, as happened in the game. Um, okay. But instead of e3, we see rook to d2 by Magnus. And now, as I just said, rook a to c8 was Jan's choice in the game. But we'll see that this ends up being uh, a, a little bit risky, actually. This imbalance of the two rooks versus the queen uh, tends to favor the two rooks if they can get coordinated. And so by playing rook a to c8 and allowing uh, Magnus to capture, uh, Jan is really now relying on the activity of his pieces. It's sort of a dynamic versus static advantage that you might have heard of before. Uh, black has the dynamic advantage because the rooks are discoordinated, and black has active pieces with which to kind of attack. But statically, the position should favor white. The two rooks tend to be better than the queen, and of course, black structure also uh, allows white to, to attack some weaknesses. So by playing rook a to c8, Jan really commits himself to finding solutions to these problems uh, in the near future. Because given enough time, Magnus will organize the pieces, Magnus will attack the weaknesses, and win the game. Uh, so rook a to c8 is definitely not without risk. This is a very risky move by Jan. Uh, and that's why I think e3 might have been a better, better idea. Because if rook a to c8 is the best that Jan has against e3, then we should be happy as white, you know, with our opponent taking on a little bit of risk here. Now, after rook to d2, I think the, why this is a bad move is because uh, black does have a, a very convincing way to get equality without risking quite as much. So uh, we've talked about how the endgame tends to not be uh, great 
explore black, but black has a nice resource here to sort of permanently ensure his bishop is going to be a fantastic piece. So I'll give you a moment to, to think about it, see if you can come up with, with any ideas. And, and Great Wolf in the chat is jumping a little bit ahead of me. Uh, the, this bishop takes e3 stuff is going to come up like 60 moves later. <laughs> uh, like I said, it's, it's a long game. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah, f5 is, is a pretty thematic move, um, giving this bishop a, a square, but also, very, very importantly, introducing ideas of, of f4. When you have the queen against the two rooks, or just in general, um, and I know we don't have the queen against the two rooks just yet, but it's really important that the queen is able to make threats against the enemy king. These checking opportunities are what allow the queen to kind of keep the balance. So f5 would be good, um, but it's actually more direct than that. It's more permanent than that. It's turning uh, Black's dynamic advantage, the active pieces, into uh, a more permanent advantage to make sure he doesn't have anything to worry about in the end game. Which, OK, now I've given so many hints that the, the, your, your thoughts might be a little bit clouded. Uh, the move b4 is the one that I think Jan should have gone for. Uh, and the idea is that if you think you're going to win a pawn, uh, not so lucky. Not, you're not quite that fortunate. And black is, is doing OK here. The king is now weak. The pawns are fractured. Yes, white has this passed pawn, but it's not going very far. Um, of course, white doesn't have to fall for this trick and can play something like e3 as sort of planned. But now the idea is we're going to cement our bishop on this really nice square of c3. And this is the more permanent. Um, advantage that, that I was talking about. Not that black is better, but black has a very, very strong bishop. So it doesn't really matter that our knight should, in theory, be better, because Jan very directly has this amazing bishop on c3, hampering all of white's major pieces. And black should just be totally, totally equal here, in, in my opinion. Um, so I like this idea of b4. Instead, rook a to c8, but this does come with some risks. So white does capture. Uh, and we get this move queen to d5. So uh, Jan has the right idea. He has very active pieces. He needs to do something with them before white can get coordinated. So targeting this pawn on b3, we now get uh, pawn to b4 by white, a4 by black. And now Jan is, is hoping to take advantage of the weak a3 pawn. And if he can do so uh, successfully, then he should be able to, to draw the game. Uh, okay, in the game we get e3 by white. This was always eventually going to be the plan. The bishop steps back to e5, and h4 by white is a nice improving move. It's nice to have two options for this king so we don't ever get perpetualed or, or checked annoyingly by the queen on this diagonal. And this pawn uh, is actually going to be used in, in another really important theme in the position. Uh, now Jan plays a very controversial move, h5. Um, the Lee chess board gives it question mark, exclamation point. I'm going to turn those off. I hate those annotations. But <laughs> uh, why is this move controversial? Well, I believe Jan played this move because black does have reasons to be concerned about this pawn having more mobility. And the reason is uh, black's king is actually going to be really relevant in this endgame. Uh, if white can organize the rooks to come and attack the black king, there's very serious chances of just checkmate occurring. Uh, and this is going to be an excellent segue into another historical game to look at. I'm actually going to look at two historical games to give you some idea of what's going on in this end game. How do these players have any idea what's going on? Well, the answer is they're familiar with chess history. So I first want to turn your attention to another world championship game. Uh, does anybody remember the Leko Kramnik match? I was barely alive. Uh, I was alive, though. <laughs> um, let's take a look at it. I didn't mean to start at the beginning, but going all the way forward, we see that we're going to end up in a similar position. Um, after one more move, see that Kramnik was organizing around this pawn. 
Leko had had enough of that pawn, sacrifices his uh, exchange, and we end up in this endgame. So this is actually a much better version of the rooks versus queen endgame for white than we actually see in the Jan Magnus game. Now, saving grace for Jan, he still has a bishop, so it's not quite this simplified. Uh, but we're going to see that even when you just have three versus three on the king's side, life can be really, really difficult for the queen. The rooks can organize, attack weaknesses, and the queen is simply not enough to keep these pieces defended. So really quickly, I just want to show you what happens. First of all, black can easily pick off the a4 pawn. It's the benefit of just having two attackers to one defender. The queen is, is sort of helpless against that. So that pawn's gone, but that's fine. Um, we see that white is, uh, as expected, trying to make some threats around the black king, but black is able to parry these. And then uh, black locks the structure over here, uh, making this f2 pawn a more permanent weakness. There is one moment of tactical uh, importance here. That's that queen h6 gets met by rook a6, and this queen is actually totally trapped. So you can't take that pawn on h6. That's why we see f3. And then slowly but surely, Kramnik maneuvers the rooks and eventually manages to uh, get, or sorry, Kramnik maneuvers the rooks and manages to get uh, Peter Lecko stuck here. This move, rook 2 to a6, is actually um, convincingly winning. So to win this game, all Kramnik needed to do is win one of these pawns, then he'd be, be up a pawn. And rook to a6 is actually uh, making two threats at the same time. So threat number one is to come to a3, adding a second attacker to the f3 pawn. And you see threat number two to add two attackers to the f3 pawn. This one's a little bit more subtle. So rook a3 is the first idea. And what is black's second idea to get two attackers there? That's exactly right. Rook f4 and then rook f6. So to prevent rook f4, white would need to attack the rook on a6 to keep this rook from moving. To prevent rook a3, white needs to attack the a3 square. Attacking both of those squares at the same time seems really, really difficult. Um, and queen a4, sadly, not a good move. <laughs> so white is sort of out of luck here and can't defend both. Goes king g2, but this does allow rook f4, rook f6. Then black just takes this pawn. Of course, defending with the queen is, is pointless. Um, up a pawn in a king pawn endgame is going to be easily winning for black. Uh, so what's the point of showing this game? Well, the point of this is that it makes it really, really apparent the kind of danger Jan Nepomneshi is in. If things ever, ever, ever simplify in Jan's position, um, where we get either like four versus four on the, on the king's side, or even a little bit more simplified than that, it's not going to be pretty. The rooks are going to easily be able to double against the f7 pawn and create all, all kinds of threats. Um, I want to show one more example because I found it very funny. So just as I am referencing Leko Kramnik, um, I actually found an annotated version of this game and it references an older game between Gurganidze and Averbach. And in this game, uh, it's even more convincing, actually. Uh, Black was able to, to keep track of this pawn. Uh, but then white was able to make use of threats of checkmate around the black king to slowly bring the king forward and then eventually trade into a winning king and pawn endgame with, with rook to h7. So this uh, I, I like even better as an example because it highlights that the rooks can make some serious checkmating threats against the king. Now I don't want to spend too much time here because we have a lot more ground to cover in, in our actual game. But again, this historical context Understanding uh, past games that are similar to your current position uh, really helps you uh, in decision-making processes, in the decision-making process. So what's the point? The point is that if given the opportunity, Magnus will gladly trade this knight for this bishop and have a, a very good chance to win the end game, even if it's objectively drawn. For example, that Leko Kramnik game, objectively, that should be a draw. But when it happens over the board, 
uh, quite often you're seeing that the side with the rooks uh, is able to win using these, these various threats. So just want to highlight, Jan is in a lot of danger here, which is why he needs to be very accurate and why he ran into a little bit of trouble in the game. Uh, so at this point, obviously Magnus is in quite a bit of time pressure. And Jan is trying to uh, both pressure Magnus on the clock and um, not go too far down on the clock himself. And so bishop b2 is played in the game. This turns out to actually be a, a pretty serious mistake. Uh, Jan needed to go with queen b3 right away to apply this kind of pressure. But understandably, what turned Jan away from this idea? Well, he didn't want to allow knight takes e5, f takes e5, and something like this. Because we've seen just how dangerous the rooks can be, it's actually very, very difficult for black to fully uh, save the game here. You have to calculate very, very accurately because otherwise you do end up getting checkmated. For example, queen takes b4 uh, is actually losing the game, if I remember correctly. Like something like check. Again, cheating with the engine here, just to, to show the idea. Um, g4, I think, is the idea. Yeah, g4. And somehow, some way, uh, black is getting into quite a bit of trouble. Yeah, rook hg7. Like, obviously, not a lot of time on the clock. These things are going to be difficult to see. But uh, the, the point is that black is, is getting into a lot of danger here. Like, queen e1. This is like plus six. And yeah, OK, the, the h pawn is also going to be good enough to, to tell the tale. But that just shows you how easily you can go wrong. Like, queen takes b4, why would you not capture this pawn? Turns out black needs to make use of threats over here and queen e2 to help defend his h5 pawn. And that's the way that he can sort of balance the game. Now, that's a lot to ask of somebody with 20 minutes on the clock against somebody with three minutes on the clock. Uh, and keep in mind, there's no increment at this point. So I wanted to highlight that while the majority of the mistakes this game are made in the next few moves, it's under sort of enormously difficult circumstances. It's the world championship, low time on the clock, and very, very precise calculation is, is needed in these end games. So that helps us understand, right? Uh, Jan is aware of these games where the two rooks beat the queen. Magnus is aware of the games where the two rooks beat the queen. So queen b3 is not high on your list of things that, that you really want to be doing. So bishop b2, trying to keep the bishop alive. Or if you take with the rook, at least getting a much better version here, right? We can uh, take on d3. And the rooks are far, uh, much further away from checkmating the black king than, than otherwise. So bishop b2 is the idea. Magnus finds the correct rook to c5, queen to d6. And then again, this is where Magnus misses his fantastic opportunity to, to win the game in style. But once again, it's going to be uh, requiring sort of a, absurdly accurate uh, calculation abilities. Three minutes on the clock, he couldn't find it. Uh, as you all probably know, Rook c to c2 is winning. And again, this goes back to threats around the black king. Just to show you the line and sort of show you how difficult it can be, uh, takes on a3, knight f4 is the idea. I'm sure Magnus got this far. But after queen to f8, it's actually a very, very narrow uh, line for Magnus to walk here. You go rook c7, um, rook d to c7, introducing this threat, uh, take on b4, you check. Check. A lot of these are only moves, by the way. Bring the other rook in, knight back to f4. And then the idea, uh, by the way, g4 is very important. The idea is you can sacrifice all manner of things because you're able to use your h pawn to promote. Um, and just to show you how the line ends, white picks up a bishop on a3 and is going to be up a rook. So, you know, points to you if you're able to calculate all of that in three minutes. Uh, you would be better at calculating than, than Magnus Carlsen. <laughs> um, so Magnus, understandably, didn't see all that. Went for slightly safer options with rook to d1. We see some simplifications. And now Jan goes a little bit crazy. So he's trying to pressure Magnus on the clock. They have five moves to make before the time control. Um, but I really don't understand why he's not capturing on b4. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Make use of this pin. Take this pawn while you can, uh, because otherwise you might end up in, in serious trouble. Now, what he might have been worried about is allowing this knight to f4 with complications that we've, we've sort of seen before. Um, so he plays this move e5, which I think is you know, fair enough. That's a good start. Uh, Magnus plays rook to c2. And now queen to d5. And this really is, is the mistake. So 
Uh, you know, e5, fair enough. You want to take away the f4 square before capturing on b4 to stop knight f4. But here, it, it really is time to take this pawn. You, you need to capture this pawn to make sure you're, you're not going to be any worse. Instead, he chooses this move, queen to d5. Magnus realizes that rook d1 was a little bit dumb and puts his rook back on a square where it's defended. But now, of course, you, you can no longer take this pawn. Right, this knight's no longer pinned to the rook on, on d1, and Magnus is again going to be in good practical position this game. Now, the, the computer is still giving zeros here, but understanding what we know about, uh, about this endgame historically and practically, it's going to be very difficult for black to keep everything under control. Um, okay, uh, continuing on here, I think my laptop might be uh, dying here. Okay, they can hear me? All right, sorry guys, more technical issues, it's all my fault. Um, but we're back in action now, and I was just saying, as so often happens in chess, uh, Magnus makes a mistake on the 40th move here. So see if you're able to find the, uh, the winning move here for Magnus Carlsen. Uh, and again, it's, it has to do with this idea that the queen is not going to be able to survive in the long run, uh, practically at least, against these two rooks. So just taking on e4 is what Magnus did in the game. Uh, and the problem here is that life would be great if black would simply take us, and then we get this end game that we want. But black is not going to take the knight after knight e4. <laughs> so yeah. Um, the live audience, good enough to be Magnus, not good enough to be Stockfish. It's tough. What about taking on a4? Taking on a4 is great, except again, black's not going to take your knight. Um, and actually, no, black might take your knight here. Um, and how are you actually picking up this bishop? Because, OK, well, that hangs a rook. And otherwise, I'm going to bring my queen. So notably, black's pieces are really awkwardly placed here. And so we don't necessarily have to do something immediately. So I like the idea of knight to a4, but the problem is you don't have rook d3 in the ends to capture the, the bishop. So there's an improvement on this idea of knight a4. <clears throat> Any ideas before I show it? All right, well, let's just show it then. It's rook to c2. Um, it's a very subtle move, but once you see the move, it's, it's not so hard to understand. Basically, none of these pieces can move. And so uh, white plays this one move, and then is able to take on a4, and then is able to come with rook c3 and get this endgame we have so desperately been seeking. 
Um, so rook d to c2 that was, was the nice move that would have let Magnus have a much, much easier time in this endgame. Instead, knight to e4, and we are in for the long haul. Black manages to keep this pawn on a4, and it's, it's going to be quite a fight here. So in the game, we see Magnus organizing the pieces, gets this knight to f4, applying a little bit of pressure here. But the problem now for white is you can never fully commit yourself to attacking this king because this pawn is queening so, so quickly. And because of that, black should be able to survive the end game now. Now, obviously, that's not quite what happened. So we're going to skip forward a few moves. Um, OK, so we end up in this position, right? Uh, Magnus has actually come up with a really uh, nice plan to try and get rid of this pawn on a3. So just as with two rooks versus a queen, two rooks and a knight versus a queen and the bishop, uh, white has one advantage uh, just inherently, and that's that he has three attackers to two defenders, right? Black simply only has two pieces. So Magnus's point is that he wants to go knight c2 and just take this pawn on a3. He's organized his pieces, Yes, these rooks are, are fairly passive, but they needed to be in order to both defend the king and attack this pawn. Uh, now, the problem that he has is black has a really great idea here of doing nothing. So king to h7, king h2. And then here, if black bides his time with something like king to g6, doesn't touch these pieces, then white's going to be in for a really difficult time trying to, uh, trying to, to make progress. If you continue now with the plan of knight to c2, your plan sort of fails at the final step because bishop to e5 is a, a really nice move for black. You don't have time to take on a3 because this rook is attacked on a1. And if you move the rook out of the way, black is happy to repeat. And if you try again, <laughs> uh, I'll, go, I'll come to e5 again. If you come back to d4, I can just come back to d6 simply. And you can just never really find your way to, to capture this pawn comfortably. So uh, because of that, I think if king g6 were to be played, Magnus would have to take his time and, and find some other way to activate the rooks, try to get them behind the pawn, and we would be in for uh, another long fight. Instead, Jan goes for this move, queen to e4. And uh, this is going to give Magnus a, a great opportunity here. He actually just captures on a3. And now, just as with the two rooks versus the queen, an endgame like this is also not going to be comfortable for black. The, these pawns are simply so weak that even with just a rook and a knight versus a queen, Magnus is going to be, be able to pick up those pawns eventually. Uh, he's going to be able to pick off those pawns sort of one by one and use his own pawns to, to try to win. And we're going to get something very similar to what happened in the game. Instead, Jan was able to keep the game going with queen to eight, takes h4, king to g1, and now white's rook is attacked. So uh, uh, black has, has a tempo here after queen to e4. Black's queen is also attacked. Uh, and the last thing I want to, uh, to mention in reference to sort of historical games is this game between Georgiev and Meizitz. Uh, Mises from actually this year, the 2021 Grand Swiss. So Jan goes for queen e4 in the game, but actually has a pretty interesting option to try and capture on g3, with the idea being that he's, he's hoping he can eventually pick up um, the pawn on, on e3 as well. And actually the better version of this would be something like queen g4 first, and then bishop takes g3. And just bear with me here, let's say it works, something like this. Um, and so this seems like a really unusual endgame. Uh, but it turns out that white is probably uh, winning in this endgame as well. And how can you possibly know that? Well, if you keep up with chess, you, you follow a lot of the interesting games going on, then you might have seen this game between uh, Kirill Georgiev and Norman's Mises. And what happened in this game is, believe it or not, almost this exact endgame. We have two rooks and a knight against a queen and a bunch of pawns. And even though the computer at the beginning of this endgame is like, yeah, the queen's doing fine, uh, one by one, uh, white was actually able to pick up these pawns here, coordinating the pieces. And next, the b pawn falls. Knight takes pawn. And then even these kingside pawns that are connected 
white is able to slowly but surely uh, press forward and win. So he wins all the pawns. And then actually, these end games with the queen versus two rooks and a knight uh, with no pawns on the board tend to be winning for white given any big exceptions. Just to show you how that happens, just like with the pawns, white finds a way to escape from checks and then walks the king down the board. And eventually, the end is near and checkmate is, is coming quite quickly. So crazy end games, right? But just by following chess, you start to build up this knowledge of the different things uh, and that helps you make decisions in your own games. So. Just goes to show you why these players are avoiding certain endgames, why they're going for certain endgames. They follow chess. They, they know these things. And that is the huge benefit that you can have in, in your own chess games. When you follow chess, when you watch commentary like this, you get exposed to these amazing ideas, uh, and you can learn from them to make decisions in, in your own games. So that didn't happen in the game. And we actually have like 70 more moves to go, but I'm just going to sort of zoom through them here. Uh, basically, what happens now is we see Magnus trying to organize his pieces against these weaknesses, um, all while avoiding various checks. Now, black tries to keep white pinned down to this e3 pawn. Magnus tries to shuffle around with the rooks to find the perfect moment to win one of these pawns. In the game, that moment finally is arriving. Uh, we see one or two more repetitions. And then finally, rook takes f5. The first pawn falls. Now, perhaps, uh, you know, Jan could have held on a little bit better. But uh, more or less, I think this endgame was going to be inevitable. So we see rook takes f7 in this case. And Magnus, again, transposes into a similar endgame to what we were just looking at. And unfortunately, I couldn't find too much historical precedent for this exact end game with the rook and the knight against uh, the queen with some extra pawns. But uh, now there is one. It's called the 2021 World Championship. And from here on out, I'm not going to delve into the crazy analysis of this end game because it's very much specific based in calculation and sort of inhuman at times. Basically, white is going to try to keep his king sheltered by these pawns and very slowly but surely advance them up the board until he's able to win. So just zooming through the moves again. Um, I'm not here to give you the details on what's coming on here, going on here. But eventually, Magnus finds a nice little formation to avoid checks. Um, takes him a while. But you see here, he brings the knight back to g1. And then with the queen checking from the left, he first puts this rook on d4, blocking checks from the diagonal. Then this knight on e2, blocking checks from the side. And once he's done that, he can successfully push this pawn forward to e4. And step by step like this, he continues pushing forward. We see checks. Um, Jan eventually does play h4, trying to trade these pawns. And I think this is a good idea. It helps uh, remove some of that shelter for the white king. And so we continue onwards. And eventually, uh, we see the rook in front of the pawns. e5 gets played, queen a2, king h3. And this is the quote unquote losing move for Jan. It turns out, for whatever reason, and I don't think Jan could have been expected to know this, um, the drawing idea essentially revolves around making sure this knight can't get to h5. Once this knight lands on h5, the white king has enough shelter up the board to, to win the game. And my, my brief summary of what's going on here is at the beginning of the end game, the white king was safe on these squares because the pawns were on this half of the board, providing some shelter. Now that the pawns have advanced, the white king actually needs to come up here to have enough shelter to escape checks from the queen. And so to facilitate that, we need this knight on h5 so that we can walk our king up the board, hide behind the knight, and now we're, we're in good position to advance the pawns while still having, having shelter. So the, the drawing moves here are queen b1 or queen c2. What do those have in common? Well, they target this rook to prevent knight h5. If white tries to solve that, only drawing move is queen d1. Again, just trying to stop knight h5. If you try king h4, again, going for knight h5, only drawing move is queen e1, pinning the knight to stop this move. Try king g4, I need to go either check or queen g1. Again, stopping knight h5. And that seems to be the drawing idea. White can never comfortably get this knight to h5 
and the Black Queen is able to uh, tactically prevent it at, at every turn. And that's why the end game is a draw. Now, I would never find this idea, and Jan was not able to find the idea. He goes Queen e6 instead. But now this is, in fact, losing because we get our knight to h5 by force. And then the rest is, is sort of history. Uh, Jan could have made life very, very difficult for Magnus by going queen to a2 here, when it takes white a full 30 moves, according to the ta table base, before he can advance one of his pawns. But theoretically, should be winning with knight h5. Um, in the game, though, the game ended uh, a lot more quickly with Magnus taking advantage of certain tactics to push the pawn, gets rook f7 um, again takes here, is actually losing to a king and pawn endgame, of all things, with a victory. Uh, so king d8 instead, and now f5. And now again, we're going to see this idea after knight g7. The white king has shelter um, on the other side of the board, finally. And that's why it was so important to get the knight, the knight forward. And so start to finish, that is the longest uh, game ever played in a world championship match. And that's my explanation of, of what was going on sort of at, at every turn. So any final questions for me before I, I turn it over to our uh, wonderful Grandmaster in Residence for the next hour? Any questions at all? I know this is a behemoth of a game, and there was a lot that we talked about. But the, the main point I want to take away is how useful it is to have those historical games, to have that knowledge, and how you can use it to make decisions, and how these players did use it to make their decisions in, in this game. All right, well, with that, thank you all so much for watching. I don't want to take up any more time because we have uh, former US champion Alex Shabalov here to delve into some more end games and talk about fortresses, which Jan was not able to find. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.